Um, last time when I was here, I taught you a, a Swahili church greeting, which said, Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Can you remember? Let me see if I'll get a response. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Amen. Amen. Good, James. <laughs> you are a good disciple. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It is the same greeting, and that makes us more connected. Uh, thank you, Reverend Dana and your team, for having me here to share even today. I don't take it for granted, and I appreciate that we are connected, and we are one family. We who are sitting here, and even those who are following us uh, via Zoom and other platforms, we celebrate you and you are great people in God's sight and we are one family of believers and we thank God for that. We continue with the theme of Advent or in the season of Advent and uh, we continue to prepare our hearts for the birth of Christ. It's an awesome season and we will be interacting through the theme, prepare the way as it has been read in the text of Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Imagine of your childhood friend, a distant relative or a neighbor, who has ascended the social order and has become a renowned figure in a society. Perhaps even a celebrity of the times. The key figure sometimes gives you some surprise calls or even always returns your calls whenever they are missed. Then a time comes when you have to introduce them in a very important function. You know so much about your childhood friend. You are aware of your upbringing more than anybody else could. How would you feel if you have a such an important person in the society in your life? Tell a joke about your friend, perhaps one of the funniest things that they have done as a way perhaps of connecting with the crowd. John finds himself between bursting in childhood memories of Jesus Christ and inviting a divine one to participate in a spiritual ritual as any other ordinary client of his ministry. Evangelist Mark presents to us an immediate context of the arrival of good news through whom? Through one who he knew, Jesus from his childhood. No other person would have done this better than John the Baptist. Remember, when Mary the mother of Jesus visited Elizabeth. Oh yes, in Luke chapter 1 and verses that 9 to 14. Their reaction was, when Elizabeth had Mary's greetings, the child, that is John, lived in her womb. Elizabeth was six months pregnant at this time. From this ex experience, we can imagine of the mystery of John Jesus' relationship and how it would shape the, both of their ministries. Just to drink a little bit of this. Jesus is getting introduced to a child by a childhood friend whom they have grown together. And perhaps there is something that he knew more than anybody of us. It is believed that John was raised in the wilderness, according to Luke chapter 1 and verse 80, 
was called by God in wilderness, preached in the wilderness, and was mostly likely imprisoned and died in the wilderness, as commentators would argue. However, John the Baptist's main role was to prepare the way of the Messiah and to make his paths straight. The mission of John the Baptist in preparing, in preparations to Jesus' public ministry, points us again to the advent. Prepare the way of the Lord. Just to imagine, when we have special occasions, we prepare differently. If we have special guests that we are waiting, we prepare differently. If we are going to go for an adventure, we prepare differently. And here, we are on a spiritual adventure. A moment when the divine breaks through the barriers of sin and joins with humanity for forgiveness and reconciliation. This is a season whereby we are called upon to set our hearts for a divine visitation of the moment. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 to 13, constitutes a prologue to, Mark, to Mark's gospel, which establishes the major theme, the beginning of good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. The good news that Mark the evangelist is presenting here could be in two folds. One, the good news as pertaining the sequence of events that we are going to encounter in the evangelist gospel. The account of Jesus' ministry as they occurred as evangelist pens them down some years later. And then the second fold, the good news as it pertains the conversions of the hearts, the forgiveness and remittance of sin. Let's hold very tightly to that. We know for sure that from good news, calls us to respond and that this position in which John places us. As a prototype of Elijah, John the Baptist invokes Isaiah's the prophecy of Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare a way a voice shouting in wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Therefore, John the Baptist comes in as a messenger and as a voice that shouts. Ordinarily, we do not shout if things are okay. Indeed, if someone starts shouting from any corner of this sanctuary right now, we would just pause, face the direction in wonder. What's up, folk? Is everything okay? In other words, the messenger is calling people into attention by raising an alarm that all is not well. His message of shouting, his message of calling, is a clear indication that there is something wrong with humanity. And I would pause and say, and that is specifically the message of Advent that there is something we can do in a season like this. 
Mark pushes the discussion a little bit further in describing the nature of the messenger or the nature of the message. John the Baptist was in the wilderness calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins, as in Mark 1 and verse 4. To bring this into our context, John's message is calling us into repentance. Advent is a moment of looking down deep into our hearts, deep even to the corners that nobody knows about. I remember when we were growing up, my father used to tell me, the heart of a human being is a dense forest. And there are some quarters even that human being does not know themselves, live about others. So it is a moment of looking deep into our hearts, which leans us to repentance. A genuine repentance may be one of the most difficult acts of a person let alone a community. If at all you struggle at an individual level to repent, how difficult it is when it comes to a community just like this one. If you see things in a different perspective, how more difficult it is when you bring so many perspectives together. However, it is for such a case that Christ had to come. For God's reason, Christians, tradition, beings of genuine repentance, not as a human responsibility, but a gift of God. So no one can boast about this one. Freely we are given, freely should we give, and freely should we share. It is this gift that John the Baptist is inviting us today to embrace and to encourage the world around us not to neglect. Oh, hear the pronouncement. One stronger than I am is coming after me. I am not even worthy to bed over and loosen the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. When John is talking about someone stronger than him, he knows exactly in what perspective he is talking about. Remember as we said earlier, this is a fellow who had grown with Christ, who had known Christ, whom they had encountered even before their physical birth. Remember, they were all children of influence from God's divine intervention. Zachariah and the wife, they had spent long time without a kid until the angel comes and prophesies. To Elizabeth, who conceives, and later the same angel prophesies to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Perhaps in their heart group bringing, they have heard their mothers talking about their encounters with angels, and perhaps what they would accomplish in their later ministries. So when when John the Baptist is talking about someone who is coming is stronger than me, perhaps he has had some stories and experienced Jesus in his younger time or age doing things that human mind cannot fathom. So, however, he tries to draw distinction between his ministry, that's John, 
and Jesus' ministry. Like many of us, John's expectations of what Messiah should do and not do. The Messiah finally comes, and we, and we know very well, he did not only allow people to untie his sadhus, but he also allowed the most downtrodden, despised, and excluded by the society to anoint his feet. The Messiah comes contrary to what John had predicted. Though powerful, though mighty, but he comes as a unifying factor, a bridging, a br and as a bridge between humanity. And them who had no place on the table, they find their place on the table. Remember Zachariah, Zacchaeus? He dines with the Zacchaeus. That would not have happened before. Remember the turn of events? Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus says, if I have robbed anybody, I will return it fourfold. And what Jesus exclaims later, today salvation has come into your house. That's what repentance is all about. Messiahs in Messiah's own hands, he washes the feet of his disciples. Something that only a servant and slave would have done. Though being very strong, that John could not have untied the laces of his shoes or saddles, he does not only allow the saddles to be unlaced, but he goes down, removes the saddles of his disciples and washes their feet preparing the way of the Lord. The call to repentance is a call to those who are hurting us and even to those whom we are hurting to cease, to cease and desist. It is a peace under of sort and an amnesty program. Those who have been trespassed against those who have trespassed against us and those whom we have trespassed are being offered a chance to stop when they take advantage of this opportunity and when we take advantage of it too, we fight our own recipient. Repentance means not just stopping the current trajectory but also turning back, addressing the damage left in one's wake and vowing never to go down that road again. True repentance that comes as a gift from God, saying, I shall not turn back again, and marching forward. When our oppressor repents, and when we as oppressors repent, we can be free. We gain freedom. Liberty is ours. John prepares for us the way of the Lord through repentance. Like prophetic GPS device, he highlights only the route for us to take, but also the place for the lawns to come in, telling us when we need to make up a U-turn and take the right direction that has been laid for us and John calls us to participate in that and once we do that it is the hope of the church and the future that we are looking at that we can brace ourselves take a U-turn and follow the right direction in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.